I think the big game-changing technology in the UK right now is the introduction of fibre. Um, already there are 9 million premises that can have fibre from open reach, and that's at speeds that are up to a gig. In the new year, we'll be launching products at speeds over a gig. Now, what's tremendously exciting about that is that opens up a world of opportunity for new services to be rolled out in the UK. So the obvious ones are 8K TV streaming or maybe 4K online gaming. But I think then we'll see new services coming into the UK. Perhaps it'll be the evolution of virtual reality. Maybe the metaverse will start to come real. I don't think we can yet imagine the brilliant products and services that will come to the UK as fibre speeds land here, uh, here on our shores. Well, if I look into my crystal ball, I think there are two things that we need to think about. The first over the next five years will be the speed and rate at which fibre is built. I think that will accelerate so that more and more homes will be connected even more quickly than we thought. The second then is the need for speed. And this is the most unpredictable thing. Why do people today buy speeds of greater than a gig? And they don't need it, but they buy it. And I think that what we'll see is the need for speed will be more than we think. So faster and faster optical based products will be needed in the UK. That's my two predictions. Fibre will be built quicker and need to be faster in speed than any of us imagine. The tricky bit is, why, what are the products and services that are, that are going to change uh, that will require it? I'd pick two technologies that I consider have been flattering to deceive, and that would be artificial intelligence and big data. Probably for a decade, they've been promising to do many things for many people. What I'm now seeing is amazing artificial intelligence solutions that are genuinely helpful and transformational. And that enables, to use your words, that enables the blue sky thinking so that you can start to ask questions and learn and get insight into the business, into your business and what people are doing within it much more easily than ever before. First of all, when it comes to smart homes and in-home or in-business technology, the role of OpenReach, I see us as the enabler. So we'll provide really fast connections that are really reliable into homes and businesses around the UK. And there's two types of two ways we'll do that. We'll do that with a fiber product, which is a shared product. It's split one to 32, as everybody knows. Uh, or it can be different splits, that's the split ratio we choose, but it's a contended connection. Really good connection, but contended. We'll also offer a dedicated fiber connection that will allow um, synchronous speeds up and down, um, very relevant for businesses in particular. Um, and so those are the enabling products that we'll put into the market. Now, what that will allow is all communication providers who buy from OpenReach, and there's more than 400 of those, so there are the big ones like BT, Sky, TalkTalk, Talk, Vodafone, and then there are lots of other brilliant smaller CPs who offer products over the top. And I think that with the enabling access products from OpenReach, we'll see lots of innovation. And so the over the top services that those companies will provide will just continue to evolve. In the business domain, we're seeing more and more businesses, no matter what their size, moving to cloud-based solutions. In the consumer domain, as you said, it's going to be a lot about smart home technology and um, the ring doorbell being the one everybody calls out. But there's lots of others that when you have a fast, always on connection um, are enabled. So what do people get from fiber? Well, obviously you get the speed. Today it's up to one gig. In the new year, it'll be greater than one gig. And as demand requires it, our network will support whatever the brilliant optical services offered by this community can offer. We're ready to offer greater than 10 gig speeds as and when we need to. So speed is one thing. I think the second big thing though is reliability. Fiber networks are inherently more reliable than the copper networks they're replacing. Fault rates will fall by two thirds at least. 
and that'll make a huge difference to businesses and per customers who need that always on predictable connection. So the first uh, and foremost thing I would encourage people to do is to think about the mobile phone as an alternate to the to the to the landline PSDN connection in the event of a power cut. That's going to work much better. It's going to be powered. So I think that's the you know the first thing that we need to think about. The world is no longer just about a fixed connection into the home, and that might sound like a slightly odd thing for the person that builds fixed networks to say, but I do think we need to embrace all technologies. When it comes to cloud, uh, the first thing I would say is um, my approach to embracing the cloud has been one of pragmatism. Um, OpenRate as a business needs to continue to run, to continue to build that brilliant new fiber network in parallel with transitioning to the cloud. So I think about it in three ways. The first is, as we upgrade our applications, we're making them cloud ready. So I've taken a lot of my large on-prem solutions, upgraded them to the latest version, put them on a private cloud, and whenever I'm ready, I can ship them into a public cloud. So that's sort of step one. Step two then is thinking about where we can embrace cloud-based services. So not just cloud hosting, but cloud services. And I suppose two big things that we've introduced in OpenReach that are making a difference are Genesis, the cloud contact center platform, and Salesforce, which we all know is a really fantastic lead management solution. So pragmatically picking out cloud services that are proven to be robust and scalable, and putting them alongside my core IT, um, which is increasingly cloud enabled, has been the core tenant, or the first two tenants of the strategy. The third one then is we've built some cool new cloud native apps. And um, there's some great case studies that Apple have done with us on that. But I think the one that I would reference in, in this session is um, we've taken fiber planning and we've put it onto a tablet based solution with an app that's native to the cloud. And it allows our engineers to walk down the street with their tablet and plan the build of our new fiber network literally as they walk down the street. Now that's replaced the old school method of, of pen and paper, and that's really transformational. So that's how we've approached it. A lot of pragmatism, embrace cloud services where they make sense for us. And when we're building something new, we, will, we build it cloud native. Sure, so first of all, I would say I'm a software developer by trade. Um, I started writing software in the 90s and I still write software today and many of the uh, fancy phrases we use around um, software development agile devops you can you can choose your methodology many of them are founded in the same principles that software engineering has been applying for many years so when it comes to agile i see agile as as best practice and as i look inside of my uh, own it development team 50% of everything that we do now follows an agile development methodology. And that means that we use test automation, test driven development, and we have standalone development teams that are able to drop their software every two weeks. And that's given us tremendous flexibility with the business. But it does mean that you have to invest significantly in the underlying plumbing of those IT applications to support that. And there are some of my applications that are more monolithic that don't support that, which is why 50% of everything I do is following a waterfall model, but with some agile tooling within it. Now, I find that works really well for large scale infrastructure projects. So if you're building a new network solution that doesn't have a user interface that's used by lots of engineers or desk based colleagues, then the waterfall process is a very robust way to get a new solution built, integrated and deployed. So ultimately, where do I see it going? I would like us to be 100% agile, where agile means that our software development teams are able to work more independently and to drop their software with less requirement to do lots and lots of end-to-end -end integration. It'll take us a little bit of time to get there, but that's absolutely where we're headed.
when it when it comes to skills, um, the first thing I would say is, and and this is a, a subject that promotes a lot of debate, is I am a huge believer in co-location of engineering teams because I think through that co-location, it's how people learn and develop. So. The least experienced can learn from the most experienced and the most experienced can learn new things when they didn't think they could. So the co-location is point one, I think. Beyond that, it's about recruitment. So we have recruited over a hundred people in the last 24 months, augmenting our brilliant experience in-house with knowledge from the market. Within that, it's been 20 graduates. Again, what a difference that makes, bringing new graduates in um, with the very latest knowledge from university, putting them alongside those brilliantly experienced people and getting that best of both. And then finally, it's about training. Um, every single person in my team will receive training in, in, in has done so in the last 12 months, will do so in the next 12 months. And what we're investing in is training in Agile, if you're working in IT, where on the tool sets and the techniques that sit underneath that, in network, we um, tailor the training more towards the network technologies that we're learning about and deploying in OpenReach. So a combination of co-location, allowing people to learn from each other, new recruits joining and bringing that outside influence, and then really planning well thought through training programs for everybody. Those are the three things that, that we work on. My, my general view on skills and technology is that it's very geographic. And what I am finding is that in three of my tech hubs, I have absolutely no problem with recruitment at all. So in Belfast, in Glasgow and in Ipswich, I can hire brilliantly skilled people. Um, and it's, it's not been difficult filling positions. London is super challenging. <laughs> And so there's a geographic element to hiring that you can solve by having enough, you know, being able to recruit uh, in different places around the UK. The one area where it's ubiquitously hard, no matter where you try to recruit, is in data and AI skills. And that's because I think those are technologies that are becoming much more relevant, becoming much more mature. And so there's lots of people recruiting in those two domains. ECOG 2023, my plan is to first of all, tell everybody the OpenReach story. I think that OpenReach as a business and what we're doing with fiber is something that people will find very interesting. It's the largest fiber build in the UK. OpenReach as a business is very interesting. So first of all, I want to give everybody the context of OpenReach and our fiber build. Then I want to give everyone an inside track. Uh, um, the inside track will be about the technologies that sit behind our fiber build. That's both the network and the IT solutions that we're using to build the network and to help customers connect really quickly to that network. And then finally, I'll talk about where I, uh, we in OpenReach and I personally see the future of fiber going what will happen next in the evolution of fiber technology and deployment in the UK.